Hey, welcome to the Rockorama. I am Dr. Anton Robleski, and I'm here in the book cliffs of northern Utah, looking at some of the most famous and spectacular shallow marine outcrops in the world. And, you know, it brought to mind one of the most common questions on field trips with students or industry professionals, and even a question that arises in core labs and industry meetings all around the globe is, what is a hummock? What is hummock cross stratification? And what is swaley cross stratification? How are they related? You know, there's no better place in the world to see and discuss that. So that is the topic of this very video that you're watching right now. During the late Cretaceous, about 75 million years ago, this whole area was beachfront property and rivers were depositing sand from the eroding mountains to the west into the western interior seaway. There was a lot of storm wave activity in that seaway and the storm waves were constantly reworking the sand into what's called shore phases. And you can learn more about those in my last video, or you can just sit back and let me summarize it for you right now. The shore face is just part of the coastline that extends from the low tide part of the beach out into what's called the offshore. The offshore environment is fairly low energy, so it's dominated by mud and silt, whereas the shore face itself is a sand dominated succession, which is characterized by fair weather waves and the occasional but rarer storm waves. And those serve to transport and deposit sand. Speaking of transport, there's a whole variety of currents operating on the shore face. There's rip currents, there's tidal currents, there's fair weather wave currents, and as I mentioned, there's storm currents. Those storm currents take the form of orbitals, and those storm wave orbitals are what produces hummocky and swaley cross bedding. But as we'll talk about later in the video, we don't really fully understand the physics behind the generation of hummocky and swaley bedding. So that's still a topic of debate. All right, I think that's about enough context. Let's go ahead and start taking a look at some rocks. It's getting pretty hot. This outcrop that we're gonna be looking at today is part of what's called the grassy member of the Mesa Verde group. And it's a lower to middle shore face succession. And like all shore faces, it's recording a higher energy and a shallower water depth as you go upward in the succession over time. Let's talk a little bit about terminology and in the process answer the first question, which is what is a hummock? A hummock is nothing more than a low-lying ridge or a mound or a hill, and they can be found anywhere in any kind of landscape. They can be found underwater, on the seafloor. They can be found on the land, in terrestrial environments. So a hummock is nothing more than a little hill, and it's a descriptive term for a landscape feature. And a variety of processes lead to the creation of hummocks, including weathering and bioturbation. So think things like mole hills and even ant hills. But the hummocks we're talking about today originate on the seafloor and they're generated by sedimentary processes. So they contain what's called hummocky cross stratification. Hummocky cross stratification is a sedimentary structure. And by sedimentary structure, I just mean it's a three dimensional form generated by the movement of sediment and the deposition of sediment into what's called a lamina or a bed. Things like ripples and plater lamination and even things like trough cross stratification which result from the movement of three dimensional dunes either again underwater or under air because let's not forget air is a fluid, it's just a different type of fluid. They all move sediments. So when you're looking at a snow drift, you're actually seeing a snow dune. Now some people prefer to use the term dune only for a subaerial thing like a sand dune, something you'd see in the Sahara. But a dune is again a geomorphological feature like a hummock so you can have subaqueous dunes, and you see them on beaches and rivers, all sorts of environments underwater, just like hummocks. We've even found dunes on Mars. So we know that sedimentary structures are following the basic laws of physics, which makes sense because you're dealing with particles that are moving in a fluid. You can go out and watch ripples and dunes being constructed on a beach or on a lake or even in your gutter after you wash your car if there's been a lot of sediment on it. But here's the thing about hummocky cross stratification. Nobody has ever witnessed it forming. You heard that right. We've never actually witnessed and documented it being constructed in the natural world. And even weirder is we haven't been able to reproduce it in experimental tanks. Not possible. Now, if you stop to think about it, it actually makes a little bit of sense because hummocky cross stratification is thought to be the result of massive storm waves bashing a shoreline during gigantic storms and hurricanes. And with all the high energy and violent currents ripping back and forth and suspending all that sediment in the water column, making visibility practically nil, it's maybe not surprising that nobody's actually ever been able to get down there and observe these things forming on the seafloor. Even though we don't know the precise physical mechanism through which hummocks come into being on the seafloor, 
and we're not really sure of the physics behind hummocky crust stratification. We do know that it forms in the lower shore face to the middle shore face, and it's been found in countless ancient examples, both in the outcrop and subsurface, in the same location. In other words, in the lower shore face to middle shore face. Why haven't we been able to reproduce them in experimental tanks when we can make things like ripples and dunes pretty much at will? Wait, I don't know! But you know what? That's a good experiment for somebody to undertake, and hopefully someday soon we'll actually understand it a little bit better. That's what science is all about, looking for answers, and that's what we're going to be doing. I thought we'd start our discussion of hummocky cross stratification with this absolute crowd pleaser of a hummock behind me. On every field trip I've laid out here, I always like to start people off with this one because it is a model, picture-perfect hummock. In other words, it's got all the features that are going to help us diagnose and identify these things when they're not so well preserved. This bed's got all the classic characteristics of a typical hummocky bed. It's got the scoured base representing the impact of that wave orbital on the bottom where it starts to rip up and rework sediment. And then it's got those low angle laminae that culminate in an arch top, that kind of humpback top, that hummocky top. And then it starts to dip back down on the other side. And this bed really shows that nice scoured base really well. But if you look around in the region, there's also some other beds just like this one that have a really gorgeous, perfect scoured base cutting into the offshore mudstones. And since that scoured base represents a really high energy flow, you tend to find a lot of coarser grain material in there. So coarser grain sand, bits of shell and fossils. Now by coarser grain sand, I should point out that hummocks only form in very fine to fine grain sand. They don't form in medium grain sand. So when I'm saying coarser sand, I'm really only talking about upper fine. Having said that, you can still find some pretty decent sized shells and shell fragments though. And in between these beautiful clean hummocky beds, there's this laminated and yet heavily burrowed by Ophiomorpha, um, siltier sandy beds. Some people call this lamb scram, laminated and scrambled, um, but this indicates quieter water deposition. So the hummocky cross stratification represents big storm events. This represents more of a background day-to-day -day activity where shrimp and worms can come in and kind of have their way with the beds after they've been deposited. Okay, so now we know that hummocks have that anti-formal shape, that kind of hump shape, hummocky. What is a swale? Well, a swale is the opposite of a hummock. In other words, it's synclinal and it's part of the same system. So the hummock has this shape and then it goes into its neighboring swale, which is the scour and the lower part of that facey succession. And if you shave off the tops of the hummocks, you might only be left with the low angle, synclinal, synformal shape of the swale. So typically as you get shallower and shallower, you lose the tops of the hummocks, like that first one we saw where it's truncating, you're only left with some of the swales and what looks like horizontal laminae in the remnants of the hummock. So swales like this are typical of shallower parts of the succession. Hummocks are more commonly preserved in the deeper part. That's not always the case, but it's a good rule of thumb. You know, when Campbell first described hummocky cross stratification in 1966, he actually called it truncated wave ripple laminae based on the structures that we're seeing right now, which are these laminations throughout the bed. Like all good scientists, geologists love creating new terminology and publishing papers to broadcast that terminology. So in 1975, Harms and co-authors renamed it as hummocky cross stratification, and that name actually stuck. And they provided a refined description to include not just the scoured base and truncation surfaces lined with these laminae, but they also highlighted that these beds typically have a flat top with some ripples and then a drape of mud and silt. Now check this out. I'm pointing to something that's also key to these beds. These are shrimp burrows, ghost shrimps, Ophiomorpha, that have descended from the mudstone and the siltstone above the sandy beds here. And that shows us that the shrimp are actually burrowing during fair weather calm periods, not during the storms, because that would be crazy. So they're hitting the sand bed after it's been deposited. In case you're wondering why geologists have spent so much time and energy studying hummocky cross stratification and trying to figure out how it forms, it's because these beds are incredible hydrocarbon reservoirs in Alaska and all sorts of places around the world. And because they form in storm wave dominated coastlines, which tend to be very elongate in the paleo shoreline parallel direction and internally homogeneous, it makes them very easy and economic to recover hydrocarbons from. So you get maximum bang for your buck when it comes to drilling a well.
Well, I hope you found this little short discussion of hummocks and swales and hummocky cross stratification useful and interesting. Maybe you learned something. Feel free to share it with anybody that's curious about it. Um, if you like this content, go ahead and subscribe. There's going to be a lot more cool videos coming on rocks and fossils. And as always, thank you for watching, and I will see you on the outcrop.